Chapter Two of the Zeitgeist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Zeitgeist by Lily Dougal. Chapter Two. In the days when there were not many people in Fentown Falls and when much money was made by the lumber trade, Bartholomew Toyner's father grew rich. He was a Scotchman, not without some education, and was ambitious for his son, but he was a hard, ill-tempered man, and consequently neither his example nor his precepts carried any weight whatever with the son when he was grown. The mother, who had begun life cheerfully and sensibly, showed the weakness of her character in that she became habitually peevish. She had enough to make her so. All her pleasure in life was centered in her son, Bart. Bart came out of school to lounge upon the streets, to smoke immoderately, and to drink such large quantities of what went into the country by the name of Jamaica, that in a few years it came to pass that he was nearly always drunk. Poor Bart! The rum habit worked its heavy chains upon him before he was well aware that his life had begun in earnest and when he realized that he was in possession of his full manhood, and that the prime of life was not far off, he found himself chained hand and foot, toiling heavily in the most degrading servitude. A few more years and he realized also that, do what he would, he could not set himself free. No one in the world had any knowledge of the struggle he made. Some, his mother among them, gave him credit for trying now and then, and that was a charitable view of his case. How could any man know? He was not born with the nature that reveals itself in many words, or that gets rid of its intolerable burdens of grief and shame by passing them off upon others. All that any one could see was the inevitable failure. The failure was the chief of what Bart himself saw, that unquenchable instinct in a man's heart, that if he had only tried a little harder, he would certainly have attained to righteousness, gave the lie to his sense of agonizing struggle, with its desperate rallies of courage and sinkings of discouragement, gleams of self-confidence, and foul suspicion of self, suspicion even as to the reality of his own effort. All this was in the region of unseen spirit, almost as much unseen to those about him as are the spirits of the dead men and angels often a mere matter of faith to himself, so apart did it seem from the outward realities of life. Outwardly the years went easily enough. The father railed and stormed, then relapsed into a manner of silent contempt, but he did not drive his son from the plain, comfortable home which he kept. Bart would not work, but he took some interest in reading. Paper-covered infidel books and popular books on modern science were his choice rather than fiction. The choice might have been worse, for the fiction to which he had access was more enervating. Outside his father's house he neglected the better class of his neighbors, and fraternized with the men and women that lived by the lowest bank of the river. But his life there was still one into which the fresh air and the sunshine of the Canadian climate entered largely. If he lounged all day, it was on the benches in the open air. If he played cards all night, he was not given much money to waste, and there were few women to lend their companionship to many drunkards, of whom he was only one. Then also Bart did not do all the evil that he might. What was the result of that long struggle of which always ended in failure? The failure was only apparent. The success was this mighty one, that he did not go lower, that he did not leave Fentown Falls for the next town upon the river, a place called the Mills where his life could have been much worse. He fell in love with Anne Markham, and although she was the daughter of the wickedest man in Fentown, she was, according to the phraseology of the place, a lady. She kept a small beer shop that was neat and clean. She lived so that no man dared say an uncivil word to her or the sister whom she protected. She did for her father very much what Bart's father did for him. She kept a decent house over his head and decent clothes upon his back and threw a mantle of thrifty respectability over him. Anne was no prude, and she certainly was no saint. 
Twice a week there was the sound of fiddling and dancing feet in a certain wooden hall that stood near the river, and there, with the men and women of the worldly sort, Anne and her sister danced. It was their amusement. They had no other except the idle talking and laughing that went on over the table at which Anne sold her home-brewed beer. Anne's end in life was just the ordinary one, respectability, or moderate righteousness, first, and after that, pleasure. She was a strong, vigorous, sun-browned maiden. She worked hard to brew her beer and to sell it. She ruled her sister with an inflexible will. She had much to say to men whom she liked and admired. She neither liked nor admired Bart Toyner, never threw him a word unless in scorn, yet he loved her. She was the star by which he steered his ship in those intervals in which his eyes were clear enough to steer it all, and the ship did not go so far out of the track as it would otherwise have gone. When a man is in the right course, with a good hope of the port, rowing and steering, however toilsome, is a cheerful thing, but when the track is so far lost that the sailor scarcely hopes to regain it, then perhaps, God only knows, it requires more virtue to row and steer at all, even though it be done fitfully. This belief that he could never come to any desired haven was the one force above all others that went to the ruining of Toyner's life. End of Chapter 2